It's just past midnight on November the 13th, 1942. An American task force sails through the dark off the coast of Guadalcanal Island. Rear Admiral Daniel Judson Callahan stands aboard the cruiser USS San Francisco, stealing his nerves. He's in command of a ragtag fleet cobbled together from 13 surviving ships from previous engagements in the region. But they can't dwell on their condition for they're being tasked with saving the United States one and only airfield in the entire island from an incoming enemy fleet. The lives of thousands of Marines and perhaps the success of the Guadalcanal campaign itself lies on his shoulders. Just a few dozen miles away, two beasts and their pack emerge from a storm. They are the battle cruisers IJN Hiei and Kirishima, each over three times the size of the biggest American cruisers and sporting guns almost twice the caliber, followed closely by a further dozen ships. Aboard the Hiei, Admiral Hiroaki Abe examines his maps. Prepare for bombardment. But just as the guns are loaded, the radio operator gives a warning to Abe. Sir, rear guard ships report enemy contact up ahead. Admiral Abe is taken aback. That makes no sense. How can the ships at the rear report contacts ahead? And how have his screening destroyers not seen them? Someone must be completely out of position. Contact the ships and get me their location. Back in the American fleet, Callahan knows there's a Japanese fleet out there. They should be somewhere to port, but the dark hides the enemy ships away. An aide calls for his attention. Sir, USS Cushing reports an enemy up ahead. Callahan goes wide-eyed. How can they be up ahead? Tell Cushing to stand by to open fire. Aboard the USS Cushing, the captain has relayed the order. Sir, Callahan orders to stand by to open fire. But disaster strikes. Instead of standing by to fire, the captain of the Cushing orders, Stop! And stand by to fire! Behind the Cushing, commanding officer William Hank watches aboard the USS Laffey and is surprised to see the Cushing stopping. The Laffey slows, but then the ship behind the Laffey is also forced to stop, and then the ship behind that too. The front of the formation becomes a slow motion train wreck as one by one the captains slow to avoid a collision, each with less time to react than the last. The fifth ship in line, the cruiser USS Atlanta, realizes far too late and barrels straight towards the back of the other ships. We're going to hit! Rudder to port! USS Atlanta turns away from their line, avoiding the stack at the front. But then things go from bad to worse. Sir, contact to the east. USS Cushing reports an enemy up ahead. Three contacts east. How do we slot back in? Contacts are appearing from everywhere. Callahan can barely keep up. Back with the Japanese, everything is in chaos. They battle to switch the incendiary shells that they have stored and load replacement with armor-piercing ammunition. Meanwhile, the captains across the fleet struggle to find one another. Abe is receiving constant updates, although with a heavy squall, he's not exactly sure where his ships are. But it's imperative the Japanese can see the enemy. The ships Hiei and Akatsuki are ordered to activate searchlights and light up the enemy. The chaos in the American ranks is suddenly ended when two ships pierce the dark and illuminate the USS Atlanta standing alone out of position. Soon after, the thunder of guns breaks the night's silence. Atlanta firing blind into the light sources and soon receiving enemy fire in return. Turrets up and down the American line unleash their firepower, shooting at everything they've got at the two lights. They can't see the enemy, so they choose their target at random, not realizing the danger and the value of the Hiei. Desperate, Callahan orders. Odd ships, fire starboard. Even ships, fire to port. Confusion spreads across the ranks. Some ships turning their guns away from the battle to aim towards suspected targets on the opposite side, while the others disregard the order and fire anything that looks like an enemy. Meanwhile, USS Atlanta is stuck in the middle of the crossfire, unknowingly firing at the smaller IJN Akatsuki. But despite their visual blindness, the radar targeting helps nail the enemy vessel, pummeling it and starting fires across its hull. But it's not without a price. Return fire rains down on Atlanta. Shell after shell strikes her hull. On the other side of the battle, USS San Francisco fires its next salvo, just as Atlanta wanders into the line of fire. The San Francisco shells strike square into the bridge of the Atlanta. 
wiping out most of the bridge crew. The Atlanta floats adrift and on fire, but her guns still roar. They fire shot after shot at the burning Akatsuki. The gunners are determined to fight to the bitter end. And then the fires find their way to the Akatsuki's magazine. The ship detonates into a massive explosion, the entire ship vanishing in the blink of an eye. The shockwave washes over the battlefield. Admiral Abe is shocked by Akatsuki's violent end and orders Hiei to back down from the attack. Its searchlight is extinguished and the sea is plunged back into darkness, only illuminated by the flames of burning ships. Commanding officer William Hank of the USS Laffey directs his men as Callahan regroups his ships through the radio. Ship off the port bow. It's the battlecruiser Hiei. Over 22 times the Laffey's weight. It's a monster and they're on a collision course. Dear Lord. Gunners, open fire. Give me everything. But the shells from the five-inch guns ping harmlessly off the Hiei's armored hull. The USS Cushing joins in on the attack, also doing little as the Hiei pushes on its inexorable path straight for the Laffey. 310, full flank ahead, emergency power. The Laffey accelerates, going as fast as it can to escape the monster. Hank braces for impact. He looks up at the battlecruiser as they sail just in front of the Hiei, barely scraping through. Keep firing! Keep firing! The American ships keep shooting at the superstructure with all they have, the shells piercing through and wrecking the rooms within. At the bridge, Admiral Abe ignores the punishment his ship is taking. He's focused on strategizing the battle when suddenly, a shell punches clean through the bridge armor, flying a cone of shrapnel across the room and straight for the gathered officers. Admiral Abe steadies himself from the shock. He's bleeding and in pain, and his chief of staff lies dead. Despite this, the crew of the Laffey see the Hiei's giant guns turn ominously towards a pair of American destroyers. Desperate, Hank takes a gamble. Fire the torpedoes! They shoot off the launcher and plunge into the sea. American lives are hinging on the eight bubble trails speeding towards their target. But the Laffey is far too close, and they don't arm. The USS Laffey's hopes bounce right off the Hiei's hull. Please support the channel, comment, like, and subscribe on this video. The Japanese battlecruiser fires with a soul-shaking explosion. Hank sees the giant shots fly over his head, streaking past and slamming into the cushion. The shells detonate and annihilate the ship, reducing it to scrap with one brutal strike. The enemy destroyers reappear from the shadows, surrounding and opening fire on the lone American ship. Sir, more contacts to starboard. We're taking heavy damage. Hank knows it's all over. Abandoned ship. On the opposite side of Hiei, and away from the Laffey's demise, Admiral Callahan sets his sights on the burning battlecruiser. He ordered his own cruiser, the USS San Francisco, and the nearby USS Portland to hunt it down. San Francisco opens fire with an 8-inch weaponry, striking the superstructure and piercing through the weakest bands of hull armor, wreaking havoc on the ship's internals. But Hiei is far from done. The massive weapons turn around and take aim square at San Francisco. Eight 1,485-pound incendiary shells fly across the sky. They detonate into the San Francisco's deck with spectacular explosions, rocking the ship and lighting massive fires. Damage report! Superficial. No critical damage. More explosions rock the ship, but do little. Hiei's ammunition is still the wrong type. It didn't matter against the small destroyers, but against a cruiser like the San Francisco, it makes a world of difference. Keep firing! Take out those guns! San Francisco and Portland keep putting pressure on Hiei, taking shots as if they were invincible. One of their salvos strikes at the Hiei's stern, heavily damaging her rudder. But then, Hiei's hoists run out of incendiary shells. Next up is proper armor-piercing ammunition. Hiei's next shot punches through the San Francisco like butter, burying deep within and detonating inside, destroying an entire section of the ship. Radio cuts out and reports of injuries and damage come flooding in. Another brutal impact strikes San Francisco, then another and another. Hiei's next volley impacts square on the cruiser's bridge. The devastation is absolute. No one is spared. Callahan and most of the bridge are killed instantly. But then a lone man picks himself up. Communications officer Bruce McCandless rises from the dead, miraculously missed by the explosion. 
In an incredible display of sheer raw determination, he stammers over to the captain's radio and takes it over. He has no command experience whatsoever. His position doesn't even feature on the chain of succession, but he must act. Just from what he's learned watching Callahan, he begins issuing flawless directional orders, guiding the crippled cruiser and her crew out of danger, but not out of the battle. McCandless has the presence of mind to realize the flagship escaping the scene would cause panic and a rout, dooming the defense. Instead, he identifies a relatively safe position in the chaotic battle and directs the ship towards it. Then suddenly, damage control officer Herbert Schoenland bursts into the bridge, rushing to take command, as procedure would dictate. But there he finds McCandless standing alone, issuing orders. Without exchanging a word, Schoenland nods and runs back to his men. Back at the Hie, Admiral Abe is tended to by his medical staff. He's cut and beaten. With his ship crippled and on fire, Abe calls off the bombardment. The Japanese ships retreat. Among them is the fleet's second battle cruiser, the IJN Kirishima. But the battle has become such a disorganized brawl that many ships are in no position to pull back. They're left behind, abandoned by their more powerful allies. The battle drags on, ending in a whimper. By sunrise, wrecked ships lay scattered across the sea, burning, sinking adrift. Hundreds of sailors from both sides float in the water, hoping for rescue. IJN Hie would later be sunk by aircraft from the field it failed to destroy. By the end of the day, the Japanese lost a battle cruiser, two destroyers, and 552 sailors. The Americans suffered even greater, losing 1,439 sailors, two cruisers, and four destroyers. Abe would survive the sinking of the Hie, but would be heavily criticized for what the Japanese saw as snatching defeat from the jaws of victory if only they had pressed on. Tactically, the Americans claimed victory as they successfully kept Henderson Field intact, but at a heavy cost. But while the battle was finally over, the war was not. The fight for Henderson Field would continue the very next day. Thanks again to World of Warships. Check out the link in the description.